Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second session of Destinations to Die For. Thank you for being here. Last week, we didn't get through all of our first session. We'll kind of go back and start where we left off and move through. And hopefully, by the time we finish the third session, we'll have everything discussed and taken care of. Last week, we left off on our study of Hades. Uh, Hades in the, in the New Testament, according to the, the Greeks and, and the Hebrews, looking at uh, being composed of two, two places, one where the righteous would stay, one where the unrighteous would, would also be, and there's a great gulf between them. And that's kind of how we uh, start off tonight as we look at uh, Luke chapter 16, verses 13, 19 through 31. This is a parable that was given by Jesus. And the main emphasis in this parable is, is not about Hades, but it's about how we have a relationship with God and how that relationship is reflected in how we deal with other people. So we go ahead and, and look at this, and I'll make some more comments on it. So there's a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linens and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even though the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you're in agony. And all besides this, between you and me, it's a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone come from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. As I mentioned a moment ago, that this parable is more about one's relationship to God. And it's not about works. Now, it may appear from this passage and some others we've looked at that it's based upon what one does. He avoided the beggar. He didn't care about his circumstances. He saw him every day out in front of the gate, and he had all these sores, and the dogs come and made his life a little bit more misery by licking his sores. But he wanted to be free from the power or the pain of Hades. He did not want to uh, live there in that condition, so he sought the help of Lazarus and, and, and God but it didn't work out because there was so much of a great chasm between those two individuals. Now, as we look at this, uh, Abraham's bosom uh, is considered a place where Abraham was stationed more or less, according to the Jews, and he prevented the Jews from going into to Hades or into hell from that point of view. So what we see here is that this passage does give us a contemporary look at what the Jews believed about Hades. So we look at the conclusion of what we might say according to Jewish thought was that Hades was a place where both the righteous and unrighteous go immediately upon death. And so when a person breathed their last breath, they would go uh, to Hades, and there the righteous would await their uh, opportunity to go uh, into heaven at the great judgment. We also see the unrighteous were tormented there in, in Hades. So the pain was great, and we know that the, these individuals were longing to go somewhere else, but they weren't able to do that. Now, we move away from Hades into the, the last judgment. I have a quote from uh, a scholar that was written several years ago about judgment. 
It seems as though in that time, in our time today, that people do not like to be judged. People do not like to be held accountable. And so we know that from God's point of view, he's going to hold each and every one of us accountable for our sins and for our actions. And this is what he said. He says that our society, in view of judgment, God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Now, the liberal view of this is what he is saying is that people don't like to be judged. Therefore, they look at God as being one who is not wrathful, who's not angry, and therefore there's not going to be any accountability for our actions and for our sins. But we do know from both the Old Testament and New Testament that God is going to hold us accountable for our sins, and on that day of judgment, we're going to give an account of our life to them. Now, the Bible does accept a final judgment for all people, and we find in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12 and verse 15, uh, these words. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the prison or lake of fire. What we find in this verse is a very important detail that a lot of people like to overlook. And that is that when judgment takes place, all of us, whether we're very insignificant, very important, whether we have a standing in, in society, whatever it is, that's not going to count before God because God's going to judge us on a couple of things. One is our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what was called when I was growing up. I think they call it here the Book of Life. But we always called it the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written in that book? If your name is written in that book, then you have access to heaven, a place that you will spend all eternity. But if your name is not found in the book of life or the Lamb's Book of Life, then what would happen to you, you'll be judged according to your works according to your kindness, your love, and your compassion, how you treated other people. So individuals that do not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ will be judged according to their actions, but they'll be punished because they did not have Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So it's very important for us to, to realize that Part of our living as believers is to live a life that glorifies Jesus, that gives an opportunity to witness to others, and they can say his or her faith is genuine, it's real, it's not fake. They're doing it out of a heart of love and compassion. So we find that those individuals are going to have a very difficult day when they stand before the judgment throne of God. Well, the judge at the last judgment is going to be Jesus. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or whether bad. So Paul makes it very plain that every individual is going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and Jesus is going to be the judge. Now, in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, it says this. This will take place on the day when God judges people and their secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So, God is, is judging mankind through Jesus. So, he's going to be the judge at that day, and there's no way that any of us could ever escape the judgment of God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says... Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face the judgment. So we know that after we die, there is an appointment all of us are going to have with God. At an appointment, we're going to stand before him and give an account of our life, just like he said, will it have been good or bad. Again, not based on my ability to merit salvation, but based on my relationship to Jesus. And, of course, there's some good things about God judging us, and that we who have been faithful to the Lord will receive a reward. What that reward is going to be is not exactly known, but one good thing about it, you know that part of the reward is going to be our place in heaven. 
He's granted that to us. So we're all destined to die and to face that judgment and to give an account of our lives before the Lord. One more thing about the judgment is that all nations will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 33. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. What a wonderful experience to be able to stand before God and God say, you go to my right hand side, the honored side, the place that's been prepared for you. And however, those who have not been a believer in Jesus Christ are going to be on the left-hand side, a place away from the very presence and honor of God. But he says all nations are going to be judged. Now, we can look at the nations in, in two ways. One, people compose a nation. That every individual in this room, every individual is going to stand before God and, ha and have our life revealed openly before God so that we can give an account of our life. But also we find in this passage of Scripture, he's talking about nations. There's going to be an accountability for the nations, for how they treated their people, how they were able to meet their needs through taking care of their safety needs, their food, whatever it may be, keeping things going in, in life. And so we, we see that the rulers who have done wicked things, lots of iniquity, these individuals as rulers are going to be held to a higher standard because they did not treat the people right. So there's a great judgment coming for all of these nations. But also in the last judgment, we're going to, to find that the evil angels will be judged. This is what uh, Jude says. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. The angels who did not keep their rightful position in heaven, who sought along with the devil, Satan, to overthrow God's power and God's authority, these individuals did not accept their position. They rebelled against God and they will also be judged because of their insubordination uh, to God. But these individuals, or these angels, are kept in darkness in, in hell until that day of judgment comes in which they will be judged. But also Peter gives us some information uh, about uh, this judgment of these angels. He says, that for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. And so we see the very idea that these individuals, angels, will be held accountable. Now, the next section that I have is the destiny of Christians after death. As we study the doctrines of hell and heaven, we discover that we do not have enough information to give us a definitive answer on where souls go immediately after death. My personal belief is that a person goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. And the reason I believe that is because what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Remember on, on when Jesus was crucified, on each side of him were, was a thief. And each one of these th crooks or criminals were, had done something wrong that they were being held accountable for their actions. One of them railed at Jesus and said, if you're the Messiah, save us. And the other one was a little bit more compassionate. He said, we are here because we have done wrong, and this man has not done anything to deserve being crucified. And so he asked Jesus to, to remember him when he came in to paradise. And what did Jesus uh, say to him? He says, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That tells me that upon the death of an individual, we go immediately into the presence of God. Is that a part of Hades? Is it a part of hell? Paradise is what he's saying. And we look at the word paradise, it's a Persian word that basically means kind of like an enclosed park, a park with animals, plants, and trees, a very 
rustic pastoral type of environment which would be very pleasing to the eyesight, very pleasing uh, to our, all of our senses. So we know that Jesus said to him, today, not tomorrow, not in the future, but this very day, you're going to be with me in paradise. But also, Jesus, uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, these words. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to always be away from the body and home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Now, what this tells me that Paul is very confident that whenever he dies, that he's going immediately into the presence of God. He knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's walked by faith, he's not walked by, by sight, and he knows that, that in the struggles he's had on earth are going to be, re, re, be relieved the very day that he goes home will be with the Lord. But he says until then, it's his responsibility and all believers to please the Lord in everything that we do. But also in for 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about having uh, an earthly body. He calls it a tent. And he says this about death. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So it tells us that we have a place to go to, and he is excited in the fact that he believes confidentially that he is going to be there. Now, we're moving on to the next step in talking about I'm talking about the believers, what happened to them. Now, the non-believers, they go to Hades to await the great white throne judgment and their final resting place in heaven. Now, we start section 2 right here, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of hell. So hopefully tonight we'll be able to cover two particular doctrines, the doctrine of hell and the doctrine of heaven. But the word Gehenna is used for hell. Now, Gehenna was a place uh, kind of southwest of Jerusalem in which that valley was known as a place of slaughter, a place where Ahaz and Manasseh would offer up children for a human sacrifice. That displeased God very much. But yet, as time went on, they began to use it as a dumping ground for trash, for refuge, and also for the dead bodies of criminals. And they would begin to burn the trash, and that it catch the bodies on fire, and it was an awful stench, and it just really became a place that people did not want to go to. Very horrid. It was just not what you'd think would be a place that you'd even want to visit. But he says that these individuals burn sacrifices in the valley of ben Himon, And that's referring to uh, this valley. As time went on, we find that they used the valley as a place they considered the eschatological end of time associated with that. In other words, all the burning bodies and trash, they considered that as being a fire that would eschatology take place after the coming of Jesus Christ. So all these individuals who were in hell would have a burning experience like you would never comprehend. And we talked about that last week, whether hell is a literal burning fire or whether it is uh, a place of separation. Either one of them is not acceptable. Uh, to be in a living burning fire for all eternity would be one that would be very destructive, uh, be very painful, one that a person would regret because they did not make the decision for Jesus Christ. And so we see how this began to evolve. Jeremiah called it the place of slaughter because of all the children that were slaughtered there in the name of sacrificial worship to the God. So we see, as I mentioned, that it was used as a sacrificial place. And we want to look at some scripture references that 
refer to Gehenna. Now, in the New Testament, some of the scripture I'm looking at, you may find kind of strange. How does Gehenna, hell, the real hell we know from the description given to us by Jesus, how does it deal with some of the relationships he's talking about? Because he's using hell in contrast to what relationships are. So our first reference to hell or Gehenna is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Dealing with interpersonal relationships, calling a fool with a serious offense, according to Jesus, as we find recorded here in this verse. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rekha, is answerable to court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, he's talking about how you're treating other people. And the seriousness of that means that if we don't treat people fairly, we could stand in the, in the brink of eternal separation from God in hell. Now, as believers, we know that that's not going to take place, but he's trying to get our attention that it's better to treat people fairly than face the possibility of going to hell. Now, when he talks about being angry with your brother or your sister, then we need to understand we can't just call them any kind of name to degrade them, to humiliate them, that we must treat them with respect, with kindness and compassion, because he uses the word raka. Uh, that's a word uh, that kind of means basically empty. And it can be translated, some may not like it, but it can be translated stupid, impious. It's someone who did not really think too much about what they were doing. But it said if we call somebody a raka, then what was going to happen that person could be brought before the Sanhedrin, which was a 70 group of men who made decisions about the religious life of individuals. But many times they had authority also in the area of the legal system. Like, for example, the Sanhedrin tried Jesus illegally at night. They brought charges against him. They could not execute him, get it to be carried out, simply because they had no authority. That's why Pilate got involved in the situation with Jesus. But he also goes on to say that we're not to call anyone a fool. Now, the word fool there uh, is a word we get the word moron. Not to call someone a moron. This means someone who is dull, foolish, impious, it's someone that didn't have their head on right, and they had a, some more or less of a, a disconnect from their heart and their character. But he says, we don't treat people that way. That's not how we should approach people that we have issues with. It's a very serious charge of God to say to us, if we have anger towards some without a cause, without a justification, that we could as a, be subject to a place called hell. Now, that's reserved for those who are not believers. We know that our relationship to the Lord uh, is based on love and forgiveness, and uh, he does forgive us. We seek it when we say something to someone we should not have said something about. Well, the next one uh, might be surprising uh, for you where he uses... Gehenna, or hell, in connection with lust and adultery. And Jesus tells us if a man lusts after a woman, they've committed adultery with her in his heart. So verse 27 of chapter 5 begins with these words. You have heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Throw it away. But if you lose one part of your body, it is more, it's better for you to be thrown into, excuse me, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than, to, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
But he goes on to say, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Adultery. We think of adultery as the commission of an offense between a man and woman in an intimate relationship. But Jesus takes us to a little higher level and says adultery can take place in our hearts. Now, we, we think about men committing adultery, but it is possible that a woman can do the very same thing. But what he's saying here, that it's a very serious charge against us if we allow our lust, our desire to want to possess something that does not belong to us. So whatever we desire to have someone else's wife or desire to have someone who is unmarried and we lust after that person and in our mind go through those rituals of sexually having relationship with someone, then he says we are committing adultery in our hearts. Now he says with her, now, this phrase does not mean she's guilty of adultery unless she intentionally created the atmosphere to occur. This is a serious charge that Jesus makes against a man who has a sexual desire for a woman who is not his wife. But what he's saying is about plucking your eye out or about cutting off your hand. It's serious enough to stop and think, what should you do? Should you gouge your eye out? Should you cut your, your hand off? Well, should we take this figuratively or literally? I mean, shall we take our eyes and, and plop them out? Is that going to change the images in our minds? No. Because you had images before that still are going to be in your mind, in your, in your conscience. Do you cut your hand off? No. It's not going to change anything. But he's saying that you should do everything you can to avoid committing adultery in your heart because he says that that is a very serious charge. You don't want to go to hell. Again, he's not saying if you're guilty of this, you're going to hell because if, you, if that is true, then there's going to be a lot of people in hell that didn't expect to be there. The doctrine of hell has some other references. We'll go and look at some found in Revelation. The lake of fire. We encountered this in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 10. Now, it's a place of everlasting punishment. Everlasting means exactly what it says. It's going to go on forever and ever. But in the lake of fire, our first reference is the devil is going to be cast into it. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the devil has deceived so many people. They didn't receive Jesus. And because of that, we're going to find that the devil is going to be cast into the lake of fire. Now, the international version calls it the lake of burning sulfur. Now, sulfur burns. It also creates a gas. And if that gas gets in a moist place, it creates sulfuric acid. And if you remember from chemistry, uh, sulfuric acid is very dangerous. It can damage your skin. It can make you blind. And so he's saying here that in hell, the fire is going to be so hot, it will cannot be extinguished. It will continue to burn. And what is another characteristic of sulfur? Well, if you ever smelt rotten eggs, then you know what sulfur smells like. So the lake of fire, everlasting punishment for the devil. But he also says that death and Hades are cast into it. 
Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death. So we know that death, that which stings, that's what robs us of this life, that it and Hades, all this is going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and this is a second death, represents those who do not believe in Jesus, they're going into this burning lake of fire. But also, he specifically says um, that the unbelievers are cast into it. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And we mentioned a moment ago about the, about the Lamb's book of life or the book of life. And so, again, it's just another way of reminding us that uh, the second death will not result in good results for those who have avoided making a decision for Jesus. But he goes on to, we find another passage of Scripture uh, talks about eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels just kind of confirms what we had talked about. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. You'll notice that this is not prepared for you and me. It's prepared for those who disobey God because we know that for us that we're going to avoid that particular destination because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, there's another place in the New Testament talks about another place called Tartarus. And that's a place in Hades where sinning angels are kept into the final judgment. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So God did not spare his angels, but sent them to hell to wait for the day of their, of their judgment. Then move over to Jude chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 6, and this is what he says. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the great day. So everlasting chains, they have no hope of ever getting out of this place that they've been assigned to. Now, I want to look at something in relationship to hell, and let's look at some non-Christian views of eternity. There's a view called eschatological universalism, uh, and this simply believes that everyone will go to heaven regardless of their lifestyle or their belief. No one will be excluded from heaven simply because they have sinned or make, made mistakes. Now, many of these different types of belief that we're looking at, they're based sometimes rather on words rather than actually the text of the Bible. And so we want to look at our first one is a story of the unforgiving servant found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Now, if you remember that particular uh, verse of Scripture, uh, Peter comes to the, the Lord. He's asking about forgiveness. Now, this is uh, important, what he asked Jesus. Now, this is a parable, and a parable has basically one main point, and everything else is what they call window dressing or added details that may or may not be relevant to the parable. So in this parable, a lot is said, but the main part is talking about forgiveness. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Sounds very good. 
But what happens next is not good at all. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called in the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I've canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So we see what happens in this passage of Scripture. The master of the house wanted to reconcile some accounts. He called him one of the men that owed him money, and he said he couldn't pay, so what did he do? He begged the master to let him off the hook. That's what he did. But instead instead of being grateful what the master had done for him, he goes and finds another man that owes him a hundred silver coins, and he demands that he pays him right then and there. And the man begged him to give him time. He wouldn't do that. So he handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything back. Now, the reason that people believe in... uh, the universalism of everyone's going to be saved is because he says, until he could pay back the debt. In other words, they're expecting this person to go out, find a job, find someone who will loan him the money, then he can pay his master back. So they're saying that, you know, everybody's going to be saved and the opportunity is coming. But again, as I said, this passage of Scripture is really about forgiving Others, unlimited number of times when you see seven times 70. But what does Jesus say about forgiving others? He tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is very serious. He's saying that If someone sins against me and I'm unwilling to forgive them of their sin, then God's not going to forgive me of my sins because I didn't extend forgiveness to someone who really needed. So it's very important we understand that in this passage, it's not talking about everybody's universally going to be saved, but simply saying that a person needs to have a kind and forgiving heart. But we have another scripture. I just call it the attraction of the death of Jesus, found in John chapter 12, verses 32 and verse 33. And this is what John says. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Now, Jesus is saying here that whenever he is lifted up on the cross and is crucified, and is raised from the dead. He is the one who is going to save us. It's not good conduct. When we look at, we'll draw all people to myself, this simply is referring to the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to use the death of Jesus in the gospel to draw a person into the kingdom of God upon their profession of faith. It has nothing to do with universal of everyone getting into heaven. But there's another view. I just simply call it the all Israel will be saved passage found in Romans chapter 12, 11, verses 25 through uh, 32. And this is what Paul records for us. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. 
And this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may have mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so he may have mercy on them all. Now we look at uh, verse 32 and we, uh, we find that the words on them all uh, seems to have uh, the authority according to these people that God's going to extend all of his mercy onto everyone who has not made a profession of faith. They get to go in heaven. They get a free ticket to heaven. But Paul makes it very plain uh, in this passage of Scripture. He talks about all of Israel will be saved, but he goes on to explain the fact that only those who profess their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Yes, there's coming a day in which a large number of Jews will be saved, whether it's in the millennium, whether some kind of revival takes place before then. He is saying that those who are saved in that time have a place in heaven only if they accept Jesus Christ. But he also affirms the ministry of the patriarch of Abraham and all those others that God had made a covenant with, how important their contribution, understanding God's plan from the Old Testament to the New Testament. For he says, their gifts, their calling is irrevocable. In other words, God made a commitment to Israel. He fulfilled it. He tried to get them into the kingdom of God, and they have so far rejected that on a large scale. But what I do want to just take a moment to reiterate, as we had mentioned last week, is that Jesus and other disciples taught salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. We know this from John 3, 16, that God loved the entire world that he sent his only begotten son to save everyone who would believe in him. And then we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It talked about how we're saved through the agency of grace, through the agency of our faith. God extends grace to us. We extend the faith to God in Jesus, and that makes us a child of God. And he talks about none of us can ever work our way to heaven. Well, what are some of the arguments that uh, people who believe in universalism use to justify uh, their position? Well, one of them, they look at remedial punishment. Uh, they believe that there's a purgatory. Uh, they believe that people will go there and you can pray them out, you can pay them out, you can do different things to get them eventually out of purgatory. So everyone gets to go to heaven. Some may be temporarily delayed in getting there, but eventually every sinner will change his attitude and he will do what's right and he will get to go to heaven. Well, they also believe there's no incorrigible sinners, that all can change and come to God. We know that there are many people who are so tied up in their sin, they can never see the benefit of accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They'll push away the power of the Holy Spirit. And then they say, God is love. Therefore, hell is not a reality, and it's not possible that God would send anybody to hell. No, God does not send anyone to hell. A person makes their own decision to go to hell by, avo by avoiding making a decision for Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to move on to our next point of view about non-Christian views of eternity, and it's called annihilation. And this is the complete destruction of unbelievers so that they cease to exist. And again, these proponents use words rather than specific text to justify their point. Well, they use a scripture that you and I would never consider looking at, John 3, 16. I know your eyes probably go, how can that be true? Well, you have to understand that looking at certain words that defends their position. 
So what does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, the word perish simply means to destroy completely. So whenever you say something is perishing in this context, it's completely destroyed. So they're saying that whenever a, a person dies, they're simply extinct, no longer living. There's no afterlife. You're dead. You're gone. Sayonara. Bye-bye. Well, that's not what we believe as believers. John chapter 10, verse 28 says, And I give you unto you eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. Well, he says, I give you eternal life. And no one can ever, you know, pluck a person out of the hand of God, and they're never going to perish. Now, I want to stop for a moment and, and look at this passage of Scripture in John chapter 10 because, you know, I'm kind of combating this right here because I think it's important to, to address this. And that is when he says never, he means never. This in the Greek language is something called emphatic negation. It's where you take two double negatives and you put them together. And when you put them together, it means never. Now, in, in Greek, you have what's called the, the, the present reality. That's more or less indicated by what we call the indicative. Then you have something called the subjunctive and some other things. That's a realm of possibility, probability, and hesitation. And so what he is is saying here, when you put these two together, you put reality and possibility together, the double negatives, you get the word never. So what he says here, and they shall never perish, simply means because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're never, ever going to perish from the hand of God or be taken out of hell because God's got you so securely in his hand, nothing can break the strength of the bond that God has for us, he's got us security where he wants us to be. Now, we take our doctrine of eternal security from this particular passage of scriptures. Most other Baptists believe in eternal security. Once saved, always saved. It's something that we've always heard. If you've been a Baptist all your life, which I have, and of course, the older I've gotten and listened to people, I, I change it up and I say, once saved, always saved, providing you once been saved. In other words, if you've been saved, you're guaranteed your spot in heaven. Nothing could ever change. And that simply means even if you sin some of the most terrible sins that we even mentioned a while ago, like adultery or murder or whatever it might be, that God brings us into heaven because his word says nothing can pluck us out of his hand. Yeah, we make mistakes. We love Jesus, Jesus just like the pastor was saying over the Easter weekend. But we still make mistakes, and we're still in the arms of God. Well, some other, other people who believe this uh, use a, a passage of Scripture found in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 28. And it says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, he says, don't be afraid of those who can only kill the body. Who can only kill the body? A human being. But who can kill both the body and the soul? Well, actually, it's not killing, but what it means it simply is that a person who rejects Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that individual is going to be in hell permanently after their death. So we should fear God in a sense that when we reject his son, that opens us up for the lack of accountability of accepting Jesus as our Savior. So we find here uh, arguments for this point of view. They say humans are not mortal. Uh, you know, their feeling is that you die, you don't come back to life again. 
in eternity. You don't come back to life on earth again. You simply die. They also look at the, the fire and the second death simply as referring to the extinction of life. What does fire do? Fire destroys, in a sense, if you burn something like trash, it's going to consume it. The belief in eternal punishment betrays God as a monster who destroys those who do not accept him. God is not a monster. We can look at several places in the Old Testament and New Testament and see where God has acted compassionately with his people. Even the people of Israel, when they disobeyed God, chased after foreign gods, he still had a plan and a purpose for them. They went into exile, but a remnant came back, and they reestablished their nation until they decided to rebel against Rome, and then they had the consequences. But God is not a monster that we should fear in any, any way at all. Well, the arguments for... Um, against annihilation is simply the word eternal life means unlimited duration of time in heaven or hell. So we know that it could continue on after death. And the fire that goes, that never goes out and the worm that does not die indicate eternal punishment because those are the words of Jesus. Now we move quickly to the doctrine of heaven and we see some scripture references found there. And again, uh, some of these you may find unusual, but uh, again, uh, they are very important for understanding our relationship to the Father. He talks about a treasure that is in heaven in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling us not to concentrate on the materialistic things of this earth, but to concentrate on this, establishing our relationship with God and developing it in a way that we're able to serve him very effectively. He tells us our treasure is in heaven. That's where our heart should be. We should be looking forward to the day which we go to heaven. We should be also looking at ways that God is in heaven, that we're pleasing him through our life and our conduct. But he tells us, and I find this, you know, important. Uh, I, uh, I preach funerals, and I always talk about heaven, or most of the time, I use these words. That there's nothing in this life that we know of, like rodents, insects, termites, hurricanes, tornadoes. There is no destructive power that can ever destroy our eternal place in heaven. God has made sure that it is protected. It will never be attacked and defeated because God is God who will defend his place he reserved for us. But heaven is a place that God has made for us with his own hands. You and I have nothing to do with our heavenly home in heaven. Now, whether I have a great big mansion, as King James says, or whether I have a room, as other translations say, I'm going to be happy with whatever I get because God's prepared it for me. And if he's prepared it for me, that means it's going to be very special, built for me according to what I have done with my relationship to the Lord. Well, one thing we want to look at in, in heaven is the fact that we know that um, uh, we're going to be in God's presence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it says, For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Mirrors in the days in which Jesus and Paul lived were not made of glass. They were made of polished metal. And that polished metal would not give a good reflection of the person looking into it. They could see their features 
but it's not crystal clear like what you see today when you stand in your mirror. It reveals way too much that most of us don't want to see. But he says one day we're going to stand in the very presence of the Lord and we're going to see him face to face. I'm going to know him more fully than I've ever known him. But also another scripture is uh, important. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, when it says the Word was with God, that little preposition in the Greek language means face to face. So Jesus stood face to face with God in heaven. Guess what? We're going to stand face to face to face in the very presence of God. And that's something to rejoice about. Then moving on to uh, the third heaven. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. Paul says this, I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man who, in Christ who 14 years ago was called up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was called up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell at all. Now, Paul was talking about, probably about himself, that he's able to experience the third heaven. I think it's important that when he uses the word Third, uses the word three, that we look at, at the word three is meaning the divine number, the divine number of God in his, in all his glory. And so we know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all composing the Trinity, which is three. But he talks about getting caught up. He wasn't sure whether he's in the body or had out-of-body experience. He doesn't really know, but he's caught up to paradise. And he heard things that, you know, no one is permitted to hear. He's saying God lives in heaven. But he's also talking about paradise, that heaven and paradise maybe are synonymous. I'm not real sure because it's not real clear. But wherever God is, that's where I'm going to be. And it says a paradise. Now, a paradise, as we may have mentioned a while ago, refers to a kind of a wonderful park that has so many wonderful features of it with trees and flowers and animals. And so we, we know that God has prepared this place for us because we're citizens of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like glorious his. So our temporary residence is here. Our citizenship is actually dual. We're citizens of this country, but our true citizenship is in heaven. And so Paul expects God to return one day. But he also describes heaven as a city, and that is found in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He's talking about Abraham, that Abraham was not only serving the Lord and going where the Lord was sending him, but he, he saw a city that God had put in his mind, the vision of heaven, eternal place to live. The final destination for Christians is eternity, in eternity is found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now he's talking about a, a new heaven and earth, and the word new there uh, refers to something that has become obsolete and replaced by something that is brand new. Now, the question is, do we believe in cosmic regeneration? Do we believe that all the universe 
is going to be destroyed and made all over again? Well, there seems to be the thought from uh, the writers of, of the New Testament that there is going to be uh, that taking place. We see that Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13 seems to back this up. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth, everything done in it, will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live godly and holy lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about all the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with the promise we are looking forward to, a new heaven and a new earth where the righteous dwell. He's saying everything's going to be destroyed by fire, replaced with something far totally greater and new that you and I have never experienced before. I can't wait to get to new, the new heaven and new earth and be able to experience all that God has uh, laid up for, him, for all of us. But, you know, there are some people who believe that this earth is going to be refashioned, to be remodeled. And from what I understand, I, I don't see that as happening. But then again, there's always uh, different points of view. Well, the question is, we might ask ourselves, we know each other in heaven. Well, Mary Magdalene knew Jesus after his resurrection when she met him in the garden. And um, she recognized him and called him teacher simply because she recognized his voice. The two men on the road to Emmaus, they also knew Jesus. It's very important that we see that they were not allowed to recognize Jesus until Jesus broke bread. And then it says their, their eyes, their face was opened. And in the Greek language, that is in a passive voice, which simply means that upon their face that God allowed them to see what, that Jesus was raised from the dead. I know I've got just a little time, but I'm going to just uh, try to finish up this section for us. Next section is marriage relationships will not resume in heaven. Matthew chapter 22 verse 30. I won't read all of this, but basically what it says there is it talks about the, the law of Leverite marriage, that if a, a brother had uh, children, he married, he was, he was married, and then he, he died, then his brother would be obligated to marry the widow and to be able to make sure that his sons has the name of their father. Well, they came to Jesus, the Sadducees did, asking him about whose wife would she be in the resurrection. Well, Jesus simply said to them, there's not marriage in heaven. For heaven, God is a God of the living. He's a God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. Now, I'd like to do Jesus on this. You know, I said, Jesus, we're reading my opinion into this because I miss my wife. She'll be gone four years next, next month, and i like to read into this that I'd be married to her and I get to heaven, but I can't read it into it because the Bible says there'll be no need for marriage in heaven. There'll be no need to repopulate heaven because everybody that's there is there because of their faith. No one else will be coming in. And so this pretty well does the second session uh, for our study. Next week, we'll be looking at some occults, different types of beliefs about death, eternal life. Some of them are pretty interesting. So I hope that you'll be back next week. Let's close in prayer. I went kind of fast. I hope you got it all. Lord, thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for the eternal security that we have, knowing that when we die, that we're going to be safely and secure in your hands, in your arms, never to be abandoned, never to be cast out of heaven, always knowing that we're going to be in your very presence. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.